And any time I meet somebody outside Europe, they go, what has happened to Europe? And I say, yeah, that is a question we ask ourselves every day. What has happened to Europe? Europe has shot itself in both of its feet in terms of the sanctions on Russia. The people in Germany, the people across Europe are suffering. If they were to have the similar approach to China and look at sanctioning and breaking related, the European economy would completely collapse. So they realise that it's, our relations are too interconnected for that. But at the same time, what is increasing is their hostility and their rhetoric to China in terms of foreign affairs and the role. And that can only be, I suppose, fueled by their close relationship with the US. So they have become subsumed as an independent identity into just being really the tail of the US dog. We hear a lot about the battle between authoritarianism and democracy. But the truth is that the European Union and the Western world is becoming increasingly authoritarian. I've just passed the 20th anniversary of the Iraq War, a war where over a million people died, where people still grapple with the after effects of the use of depleted uranium, where nobody has been held to account for a country torn apart and a region plunged into chaos. And we have a responsibility to look back and ask, how did it all happen? Well, it happened because the people in power told us over and over things they knew were not true. It happened because a compliant media failed to ask the questions and parroted those lies day after day, beating the drum for a war of aggression dressed up as a battle of democracy against authoritarianism. So now, as another country is torn apart, another region turned into chaos, at this uniquely dangerous phase in world history, we see the same people again, baying for blood, not their own of course, seizing the moral high ground, condemning peace as appeasement, bellowing that the only option is escalation. Well, you really have to ask yourself the question, why in God's name would we believe these liars now? We need peace and we need it now. This methane emission ever, with huge consequences for the ozone, took place last September with the blowing up of the Nord Stream pipelines. A devastating act of sabotage on EU infrastructure, and nobody in the EU has anything to say about it. Neither do we want to do anything about it. Seymour Hirsch produces a very credible report that the US was responsible, along with Norway. Then US intelligence come up with nonsense that it was a pro-Ukrainian non-state group. Come on, we don't need leaks from the people who brought us the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. We need answers and that the UN Security Council and the two European members failed to support the call for an independent investigation into the explosion this week is absolutely scandalous. If we want to protect the ozone, we have to have some consistency in our policies. So happy to see you in Beijing. I've never thought that I could meet you in Beijing. Well, I never thought that I'd be able to get here. So <laughs> the pleasure is all mine as well. It's fantastic. So I'm wondering what made you wanting to come to China to have this trip? Well, I suppose China is an incredibly important country for the European Union uh, economically. Uh, but I think particularly for me, I think China is an incredibly important country for the new world relations that we are entering into an enormous power economically, but has the potential also to be the sort of leader of the, the new world. Not that I'm into leaders, but the new leader or the combatant for a multipolar world, which I think is really important. I know you and uh, Ms. Wallace, Mr. Wallace, you all being accused of being paid by China, <laughs> being paid by Russia, Iran, Syria, you being accused of being paid by multiple governments. Mm. I assume you both are billionaires now. Uh, well, that's what we would have thought. We're, we were very curious as to see where those bank accounts are, <laughs> like, you know. But isn't this, this is just a slander to delegitimize an alternative viewpoint to that of the establishment. And it's actually insidious. I mean, we hear a lot about the battle between authoritarianism and democracy, but the truth is that the European Union and the Western world is becoming increasingly 
authoritarian. It's shutting down any alternative dialogue. I mean, the hallmark of democracy for me would be the bit to critical thinking, to discuss facts, to have alternative views. I don't mind what somebody else's viewpoint is, but I defend their right to express it. But across Europe now, to have a different view, to say, hang on a minute, the Western dominated world that we've lived in is not good for humanity. Uh, we need a different way, which would have always been said and explored without any problem. Now, when you say that you're a paid agent of an alternative, that isn't radical, irrational. It's, that's not rational response. But I think it's the response because a lot of the media across uh, the Western world are, are, are actually not independent at all. Uh, so they're parroting that view mm -hmm. and shutting down alternative voices. Mm -hmm. I actually think as well that one of the reasons, and we see it very much in the war, is that in this era of social media, it has made the world a lot smaller. So in all scenarios, like wars, for example, they say truth is the first casualty. And that was always so, and it is so now with the war in Ukraine. So, but with social media, you can get an alternative view out. So they can't actually keep things secret in the way in which they would before. Mm -hmm. So now they try and shoot the messenger. So they demonize and target the person saying that rather than assessing what they say in and of itself. Uh, I'm wondering what's your take on EU and China relations? Because, you know, I don't know whether you heard the recent speech by Ursula von der Leyen recently before her trip to China, because in her speech, she's I can see her two very different opposite yeah. opinions, attitudes. On one side, she realizes that uh, trade deals, open relations, stable diplomatic relations with China is crucial for your for the entire Europe. On the other hand, she has to criticize um, what China is doing domestically. And even though many things the, uh, she that she accused actually based on a lot of lies founded by um, military industrial complex and multiple governments. And also she's expressed her huge concerns about China Russia relations. I mean, so you two very opposite attitudes delivered in her speech. Yeah. Do you think that this, also reflects the dilemma that Europe is in? Oh, totally. I mean, and Europe is in a dilemma and it's being led by an incredibly weak leadership. I mean, the von der Leyen Commission would be particularly weak. Sadly, in the powerhouses of Europe, traditionally uh, Germany and France, who had enough strength, I suppose, independently to stand up to the European Union bureaucracy, they're being led by weak leaders as well. Macron, not so much, but he has huge problems at home now because of his inability to bring in the, uh, his awful pension changes. So they're very, very weak. Um, and I think... We are in this bind. You see it in any discussion we have in the European Parliament. And people have to understand, I think people outside of Europe don't understand that the European Union is not like the United States of America. It is very much, Americans certainly don't understand this. It's 27 very different countries who have supposedly come together for their own economic interests that did serve a certain purpose, but there are huge tensions within that. So what she's reflecting is on the one hand, the absolute necessity necessity for the European economy to continue to have good relations with China. I mean, Europe has shot itself in both of its feet in terms of the sanctions on Russia. The people in Germany, the people across Europe are suffering. Uh, the states of Europe have tried to put a cushion on that to stop it really hurting, but that can only go on for so long. If they were to have the similar approach to China and look at sanctioning and breaking relations, the European economy would completely collapse. So they realise that. It's, our relations are too interconnected for that. But at the same time, so the, the situation, that is there and they know that. But what is increasing is their hostility and their rhetoric to China in terms of foreign affairs and the role. And that can only be, I suppose, fueled by their close relationship with the US. So they have become subsumed as an independent identity into just being really the tail of the US dog. That's really, and I feel very sorry to say that, and any time I meet somebody outside Europe, they go, what has happened to Europe? And I say, yeah, that is a question we ask ourselves every day. What has happened to Europe? Because it is not in our interest to have China as uh, not being a positive partner. So they know that. Mm -hmm. But it's also in our interest, I think, 
for China to be playing a role to push for a multilateral uh, world. Uh, and the problem is, is that the US are losing their dominant position. They have lost it economically um, and they are losing it politically. And in many ways, when, you know, it is, as they say, the last bite of a dying snake, it's the most venomous, it's the most poisonous and the instability that's hurting citizens all over the world, including in the US. It's so sad. It's so sad. Uh, but I think it's it's from a position of weakness rather than strength. So it's and that can go on for some time, unfortunately, and it can bring a lot of hardship to a lot of people. But that's the process at mm. play here. And I think Europe have, I don't believe that anybody should pick sides. For me, it's not about picking sides, but that's the, the way in which the narrative is being framed now. It's all about, so it's the new Cold War with really China at the helm, but now with China and Russia, with China coming behind Russia, I suppose, at this stage in the war, now they feel they need to up that anti-Chinese rhetoric again. But the process was well underway mm. before that. We used to joke, not in a nice way, that actually when we came to the parliament first, there was a lot of anti-Chinese rhetoric. That went down a bit when the, when the Ukraine war started and they had to spend all their energies giving out about Russia. The Chinese bit went quiet. But now it's come back up again because they see China sort of having Russia's back, which is all China has done. From what I've said, they've argued for peace. All they've said is if this goes too far, kind of too far, we will have Russia's back in this. It's a kind of a warning to stop it escalating. I, this is the way I would view it. But they see it as a threat or they pose it as a threat. But this is just the line of the military industrial complex, really. Mm -hmm. But do you think even with all this damage that this toxic relationship brought to mm. European citizens. Do you think Europe still rather trust United States than China? Yes and no. I mean, and you have got to say, what is Europe? Because there's a very big difference between the citizens of Europe and their elected leaders. And what you will see, and increasingly so, as we enter into different electoral periods in different European states and then across the European Union itself is that the ground is shifting and not necessarily in a positive way. So you will have uh, the centre ground who have failed people is going to disappear. We will have some far right elements, unfortunately, coming to power a lot more racism, a lot more instability. Um, but that is the background. So what is Europe? So when we talk about the people of Europe are very different than their leadership. I think a lot of the leadership know that they need to keep uh, close relationships with China. And I, I think they would be on for that. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, it's, it's, it's a difficult one. Where, where is this going to end up? I would be very worried. Mm. I suppose the point is, is that if you take Ireland as a country where I'm from, historically, we'd really strong links. Millions of Irish people emigrated to America. Culturally, we we're exposed to Hollywood. We speak English. You know, so we have that every US president wants to pretend he's Irish to play to the Irish audience. We don't have that historic relationship with China. So we don't have a knowledge and an interaction into that. When I suppose things began to change in China a number of years ago and China became more connected with the world. I know in my own country, Ireland, there were starting to be courses in Chinese. And if you were really a sort of an up and coming a progressive person, it was considered to be a very positive thing if you were learning Chinese and you were going to China because everybody understood China was going to be such an important player in the world. For me, it's so interesting now, maybe 30 years from then, how it's changing. Now, if you want to learn Chinese and you want a connection with China, you're some sort of a Chinese Asian. It doesn't make any sense. So it, it if you said, like, would we trust America or China more? European people don't have enough knowledge of China mm. and their experience of China, where they've met them. Chinese people are incredibly industrious. There's a huge economic link of Chinese people in uh, Europe. I think they know that, but they don't know much really beyond that. Mm. Are they sceptical of the US? Yes, I think many people now are growing very uh, sceptical of the US, but unfortunately our institutions, like a lot of the in international institutions, are sort of captured by the elites of Europe and America and that's not in their interest, but that's going to take a while 
to break down for mm -hmm. sure. And for me, I think one of the, and this is again the irony because they talk about Chinese influence buying up infrastructure in Europe and trying to influence, you know, uh, education in our colleges and all this type of nonsense. But like, that's what the US has done, but they don't call that propaganda. Like they've been in place in Europe They've been funding colleges. They have their think tanks in place. And this is not a conspiracy. It's just a substantiated fact. This is the sad thing that US money funds a lot of the media in Europe. They say, oh, that's because we want to fund independent media. But then it's not independent, like, you know, but joining those dots doesn't seem to happen because the people who give the message to the public are getting money in many instances from the National Endowment for Democracy or these organisations which have been in place, which is why we saw when the war happened, most of the media on message coming out with the same things all over Europe. Now that is beginning to change. The realities of the war are making it hard to hide the truth. You can only get away with that for so long. Mm -hmm. The points have to have a certain link to reality. They can't come out with completely. There has to be an element of truth in the things that they say. And now the reality of the war is beginning to creep in, not in any way mainstream, but that space for at least in the official narrative, some people saying, woo, maybe we need peace here. And in fairness, the representatives of the United States military have been making those points far more um, competently and, and correctly than the US political sphere who only want to do it for their own domestic interests because, as they say, they've no uh, enemies, only interests. And like I mentioned, there's a growing anti-China propaganda in Europe and there's a lack of understanding, knowing about China. And now the effort of helping to boost the cultural exchanges is, is not promoted, it's yeah. not encouraged. Actually, it's, it's being, well, if like many people, if they want to learn Chinese, you, they will be accused of China agent. Yeah. It's perfect, isn't it? You yeah. know, it's the sort of perfect way because ignorance, you know, and lack of knowledge is what breeds a lack of understanding. But they want to keep it like that, clearly. You know, that, that's the sad thing. And that's where a lot of this unfortunately leads. But that's, you got it in one. I couldn't put it better. I can't add to that because that's exactly what it is. And it's a, it's a tool that they're using now at the moment. And when we had it in the European Parliament, for example, hasn't had diplomatic relations with Russia for years. So how can we overcome differences and try to see something from another person's point of view if we don't talk and we don't engage? Um, but sadly, that's the place that they want us to go to. Um, and the media are not joining the dots in any of that, mm. um, which is regrettable. So how do you break it down? Well, it's difficult. It is difficult. And uh, I think harsh, the harsh realities of life and economic life, I think, will be that. Because China is very much now integrated into the economic life of Europe and the world as a dominant economic power that's not going to change. So if there was to be a breach in that relationship, people would so feel it very hard. So I don't think they can go there, but we didn't think we'd be in a situation where there'd be a, a war in Europe either. And mm. we see the same actors who stoked up that war, who used Ukraine in order to boost their own profits and sell their own military hardware, doing exactly the same thing with Taiwan which had been settled years ago. Nobody would have ever said anything about Taiwan. It would have been just accepted. There is a one China policy. That's the way it is. But that even that that is being ratcheted up massively. That reminds me of some some comments I saw uh, on Twitter. Actually, some activists or key opinion leaders from Europe, and they feel so righteous defending Taiwan against China's possible invasion even though like Taiwan is part of China mm -hmm. like you, all your countries recognize mm -hmm. that how can we invade our mm -hmm. own territory but still and they said well our NATO will make sure we defend the democracy in the Pacific Ocean even mm -hmm. though they are the North Atlantic yeah. <laughs> some colonials find it hard to shake off their colonial past you know and this the arrogance of this, these champions, self-appointed champions of democracy in Europe and America, where there's more black people in prison and or more people in prison and a disproportionate number of them black in America than anywhere else in the world, where we see the police in France at the moment beating 
um, protesters and hospitalising them off the streets where they're protesting against pension reforms. And these are the people who say, oh, we're the Democrats, we're not authoritarian, you know, we s support human values and all of this. But they're doing, they don't analyse what they do in their own countries and yet they go around the world telling everybody else how to run theirs, you know. It's, uh, it's disgraceful. And that's not, I mean, I'm well in diplomatic relations and friendly criticism. It can always be allowed either way, each way, but it has to be a two way process as well. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's just this, yeah, arrogance, shocking. Mm. So, I mean, in your opinion, what's the best for the entire Europe? What kind of relations between Europe and the United States, Europe and China can really help uh, to benefit the average European citizens. Mm. Well, I mean, for us, and I suppose the point of minute, we don't believe in camps. We live in one world. It should be a multilateral world where every country is respected, where everybody can have their different point of view, absolutely have differences, but they resolve those differences peacefully and diplomatically. So that that is the best way forward, really. But that would require the sort of demobilising of the military industrial complex where there's far too much money uh, to be made on that. I mean, it, these are the people who buy the president of the United States. The irony is, as they say, it's a democracy, but you can't stand for government unless big business and billions go to fund your campaign. So when that happens, that's the agenda that you're responding to. So the people of Europe should get on with every country and every country should be free to trade with each other. I mean, we made the point, we had to discuss, like they were making the point about, oh, China buying up critical infrastructure in Europe. You know, this is so dangerous. Now, my attitude to that is every country should protect its own sovereign infrastructure for sure. But if Chinese business is coming in and buying up, in, it's only because the governments of Europe privatise those industries and Chinese big business is perfectly entitled to buy it just as much as anybody else. And they're doing it by the rules and quite often pay uh, better than a lot of the US ones. So why wouldn't anybody do that? Like in the same way as we see criticism of China's policy in Latin America or whatever, but I've been in countries in South America, we've seen uh, where the Chinese investment Absolutely. I'm quite sure China is benefiting from that arrangement, but the other country is getting houses built. They're benefiting too. It's a much better way of doing business than going into a country, robbing their assets and, and with guns. Far better to buy it, uh, whatever. Now, I would like a lot of those countries to develop their own natural resources for themselves, but that's a different argument. So again, it's this hypocrisy that we see at every level, which is quite disgusting. But I suppose if you repeat something often enough, People are under pressure getting on with their lives, a little bit sinks in and they kind of switch off. And my experience is that a lot of people are switching off to what their so-called political leaders are saying to them now. Uh, they've had enough, but unfortunately they're not engaged in an alternative yet. They're at the stage where they know what they don't like, but they're not really sure what they like. And I think obviously historically China is so important, so we want to see that, but also to meet as many Chinese people as we can. So we think it's been great. We, we caused a story, yes, a lot of photographs with people yesterday and all of that, so very friendly and great. But we're here to learn, and uh, so far, so good. So thank you so much, Claire. Pleasure is all mine. Thanks thank a million. You. Thank you.